Yeah, you can start the session. Okay. Thank you. So, welcome, sir. Our next keynote speaker is Professor Biplop Shikdar, Associate Professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the National University of Singapore. There, he is also serving as the Vice Dean in the Faculty of Engineering. He received the B.Tech degree in Electronics and Communication Engineering from Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, India in 1996. A M.Tech degree in Electrical Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, India in 1998. And the PhD degree in Electrical Engineering from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Troy, New York, USA in 2001. He is a recipient of the NSF Career Award, the Tan Chin Tuan Fellowship from NTU Singapore, the Japan Society for Promotion of Science Fellowship, and the Leif Erikson Fellowship from the Research Council of Norway. His research interests include IoT and cyber physical system security, network security, and network performance evaluation. Today, he is going to speak on security and privacy for the Internet of Things. Sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ranjana. Thank you very much for, for, the, <clears throat> uh, for the kind introduction. Um, so what I'll do is uh, so just uh, about 45 minutes, right? And then followed by question and answer. Is that what we're planning? Yes, sir. That would be nice. Okay, good. Yeah. So that, that's what we'll do then. All right. So I'll talk to you about uh, security and privacy and security solutions for the Internet of Things. So to get us started, so this is a picture of what the IoT, or so not, not the IoT, but what the Internet used to be uh, when it started roughly about 40 years ago. And when it started, there were just four computers on the, on the Internet. And they were all on the Western side of US, mainly in California and one in Utah. And you know, back in the day, nobody owned uh, personal computers, there were no laptops and so on. Uh, so an organization such as your university or my university would have one mainframe computer and people would remotely log into these. And you know, one of the applications used to be something called Telnet. And when you were remotely logging in, uh, you would type like login, right? So the first time somebody was using the network, they typed L, then O, and then G for login, and at the time the network crashed. And this was the first use of uh, the internet. And this picture that you see here, this is essentially a router. So this is what a router was uh, 40 years ago, and this person is Leonard Kleinrock, and he's one of the founding fathers of the internet. And this is how the internet evolved, starting from four nodes to, to more and more as time went by. And if you look at the applications which were there back in the 70s, let's say, of course, this remote login thing was quite popular. And internet, oh, sorry, email was in, invented back in 1971. And a majority of the network traffic back in 73 was email. And there were other applications such as file transfer, transferring files between computers, uh, you know, the equivalent of what we are doing right now, which is the voiceover not exactly voice over IP, but something similar. I, uh, you know, it used to be, it used to exist back in the 70s also. Uh, but things started changing in the early 90s when HTTP was invented and what HTTP allowed was it allowed people to search for information very, very easily. So previously, if you wanted to have, uh, you know, if you wanted to know about something, either you go to a library uh, you look up the encyclopedia or you ask somebody who knows. Right? Uh, but uh, with the invention of HTTP, it became quite easy to search for information on computers. And this in turn led to a number of different applications such as e-commerce, social media, uh, sharing economy and so on. Right? So if you look at the way things have evolved on the internet, so before the internet, you know, we had telephones and back then when you think about any communication, 
it's human to human, right? One human will call another human, or you send an SMS message that's again from one human to another human. So in the 90s, we had the internet of content in the early 90s. And this is where you know, people would use the internet for getting things like emails, uh, accessing information uh, for entertainment and so on. And in the late 90s, people figured out that you know, we can make money using, these, uh, using the internet. And this is when people started using the internet for things like e-commerce. So this is uh, around 1998, 99 things, the companies such as Amazon and eBay, they started up. And also government started getting into this and uh, they would you do things like services on the internet, like you could pay taxes over the internet and things like that. And in the 2007, 2008, in the mid 2000s, we have this uh, internet of people and in this case, the killer application is social media. So for example, around 2007, 2008, uh, Facebook, YouTube, these things uh, got started. But all of this till about 2010 or so, if you look at uh, things that we were using the internet for, on one side, there's a human and the other side, there's a computer or on both sides, there's a human. So whether it's uh, internet of content, then, you know, it's a human trying to download something from the internet. Even when you're used, talking about e-commerce, it's a human trying to buy something using the network. Uh, when we talk about social media, again, it's a human uh, trying to upload or download pictures and, and, and uh, videos and things like that. So more recently, over the last five or 10 years, we have come to the internet of things. And the biggest difference here is that uh, there is no more involvement of humans anymore. Our devices, which we also call machines, have become smart enough so that they can decide when to exchange information on their own. So computers are the generators of information and they're also the consumers of information. So they can decide when they want to exchange information without any, any human telling them, right? So we have IoT devices, for example, who so if you take an example of, let's say, a smart grid, right, a smart power system, uh, we can put in metering in their smart meters. And these meters on their own, they can decide when to send information back to the grid. And, you know, if it's a power grid, one of the main things we have to keep in mind is that uh, the supply of power matches the demand, right? So historically, if you think, uh, you know, uh, we were, we have a meter, electricity meter at home, and somebody from power company, I think in Kolkata, it would be CESC. Somebody from the power company would come at the end of the month, and then they would see, okay, how much power you have consumed. And based on that, the power company would have to somehow figure out how much power to generate every day. This is quite inefficient. You can never predict accurately how much power is going to be needed one month in advance. Uh, with smart meters, now you have a very, very fine grained real time view of the power consumption in the network. So if power consumption goes up, you can immediately inform your generators saying, oh, you need to ramp up power, right? And similar things, similar examples can be made in other sectors also. So what this allows is that, you know, I can have meters that can give me feedback every minute or every five minutes and so on and I can process this data and I can have some intelligence, whether it's machine learning based, whether it's AI based or whatever. And that can predict, okay, well, how much energy will be consumed or how much power will be consumed, cons consumed in the next one hour. And then this algorithm can directly inform the generators that you need to step up or step down or whatever it is. Right? So that's where the power of internet of things is. So we can now have machines which are powerful enough to decide which, can, which are powerful or smart enough to generate data and then consume the data and then take action based on the data. Right? So that's where IoT comes from. And if you look at uh, applications of IoT, so this is a couple of years old, but I would think that the same trends hold right now. So common, so the most popular applications of IoT come for smart city. And examples of IoT in smart city, maybe for, uh, you know, uh, smart traffic systems. 
So you can have traffic lights, which know how much to turn red, how much to turn green, how, how long they, the light stays red or the light stays green based on the traffic conditions. So, so nobody has to control, right? Uh, then connected industry. So we have gone through multiple industry industrial revolutions and right now we are at the fourth industrial revolution. So also called industry 4.0. And in this case, the idea is that all the machines in a factory plus all the suppliers that supply parts to that factory, the entire supply chain, all the way up to the distribution points, everything can be connected and then you can operate your factories much more efficiently and in an optimal manner. So you, you, you can have a very good picture of how many uh, pieces of whatever product you manufacture needs to be done so that you, know, you can manage your inventory quite efficiently. Other examples are connected buildings. In this case, basically you're trying to optimize the amount of energy consumed in the building, connected vehicles and smart energy, which I was just talking about just a bit and, and so on, right? So there are all these applications. And then uh, if, even if you look at the market potential for IoT, it's quite high and people expect that, uh, you know, the, the economy, the IoT would be a big part of the economy and, and uh, uh, the market share of IoT would be in the order of trillions of dollars and so on, so pretty, pretty large, right? So all of these are very positive. We know that IoT can have a lot of potential applications. Uh, they can have a large market uh, share. But then if you are uh, like the CIO, Chief Informatics Officer, or, or you know, a manager of a company who is thinking about whether I should deploy IoT-based solutions in my company or not, uh, there are certain factors which tend to hold us back. And these are basically security concerns. And especially when you hear in the news, things like IoT devices getting hacked or industries using IoT devices getting hacked, then you stop and you think, okay, uh, should I really go for IoT or should I hold back till they're secure and things like that? And some examples of IoT based or, or you know, cyber physical systems getting hacked. The most common example is uh, Stuxnet, and uh, this is the name of a malware or a worm which infected uh, the nuclear power plants in Iran about 10 years ago. And uh, you know this, uh, this virus, what it did is it started spinning the centrifuges in the nuclear power reactor, and they started spinning out of control, and at some point they were damaged. And as a result, many people believe that this uh, uh, attack set back Iran's nuclear power program by about five years to seven years or something like that. Uh, then in 2015 and in 2016, there's a war going on between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, and then Ukrainians at least claim uh, that Russians hacked into the Ukrainian power grid and then they turned off the power in certain parts of Ukraine. Other examples, so this is the water department of a city in Michigan, Lansing, Michigan. And again, hackers got in and then they encrypted all the files and the computers of this water department. And then they had to pay money, they had to pay a ransom in order to get their files back. Another example is Saudi Aramco. And Saudi Aramco is the largest producer of petroleum in the world. And in, I think, 2013 or 2012, they got hacked by a, a, a malware. And what did this, what, di, what this malware did was it crashed all their hard drives. And once the hard drives crashed, they could not recover any data from any, anything. Right? So they had to switch back to using fax machines and things like that. And then they uh, had a loss of many millions of dollars. So these four examples that I gave you, these relate to you know, heavy industry. Or, or critical infrastructure and things like that. So what about IoT devices that we use at our own homes? So the best example there is that uh, sometime in 2017, uh, there was a distributed denial of service attack on a DNS provider. And this DNS service provider, its name is Dell. And very popular applications such as Twitter, 
uh, Reddit, Amazon, PayPal. Uh, these guys use DIN as their DNS service provider. And there was a denial of service attack on DIN. And as a result, normal customers, when they, act, when they tried to get the IP addresses for Twitter, SoundCloud, all of these, they couldn't get the IP address. And as a result, they could not access any of these services. And if you think about how uh, this denial of service attack was launched, this denial of service attack was launched by hacking into regular IoT devices that you and I may have in our homes. And all these IoT devices got hacked and they got converted into a botnet. And ultimately all the traffic from these bots were directed to these DNS servers and then uh, you know, resulted in a uh, DOS attack. So just to walk you through the process of this attack, uh, you know, the hackers would first get into a IP camera, for example, like this, which you would have either maybe on your laptop, maybe for monitoring your home and things like that. And once they hack into an IP camera, uh, the hackers would scan the network to see if there is any other similar victim which is, which is available. And the way they'd get into these devices is by, is by brute force. And I'll talk to you about that in just a bit. And once they identify a new victim, a report is sent back to a report server. So this report server belongs to the hacker. And then there is another command and control center that belongs to the hacker, which periodically checks the report, report server to see, okay, do you have any new victims that I can hack into? And once it gets this list of new victims, it sends a command to another server, which is the loader. And what this loader will do is it will send the malicious binary now to all the victims. And once the malicious binary is loaded into the victim, now the victim becomes a part of my botnet. So most of these will be part of the botnet for a long, long time, and they will not be used for an attack. But on the day this attack, this hacker decides, okay, now I want to launch a denial of service attack they will send a command to all of these bots. And basically they will tell them, you need to send all the video that you are generating to this target server. So in this case, this target server would belong to DIN, right? And now all the IP traffic, all the, all the video that my cameras are generating, they're going to this target server. And as a result, this server is overwhelmed. And when regular users try to access the services of this server, they can't get anything. So this is the modus operandi, but now let's see how they are hacking into these victims. Right? It's actually not very complicated. It turns out that many of the I I IoT devices, they're fairly simple and their manufacturers don't pay much attention to security. And in this case, uh, this particular IP camera, the username and the password, they were hard coded into the firmware. So if I buy this IP camera, I know that the root username is root and the password is XC3511. And if I find any other camera with the same manufacturer on the network, I know that by default, the username is root and the password is XC3511. So this is a problem of hard coded passwords and this is quite common. And then, you know, there are many dictionaries which are available about known usernames and passwords, and people can use these, these, these to try and get into your device. And there are other examples of people hacking into IoT devices. So, you know, uh, there are these two guys, they once hacked into a Jeep Cherokee, so this is a vehicle, and then they, would, they, they, they took command, uh, they, they took control of the vehicle, and they made it stop they made it come out of the highway and so on. And then there are also examples of, this is a baby monitor in which people hacked in and, and there are many other examples like this. So now let's come to the security part of IoT, right? So what does it mean to make an IoT secure? So as with traditional computer systems, we still care about the CIA, the confidentiality, integrity, and authentication. Right? IoT devices also need to have worry about these things. But compared to traditional devices, these protocols need to be lightweight. 
So traditional devices means things like, you know, your personal computers, your desktop computer, your laptop, your smartphone, and so on. So traditional computers have sufficiently, reasonably good CPU, uh, you know, desktops and laptops, they don't need to worry about power. Even your phones, you know, they may run on a battery, but at the end of the day, you can plug it in and recharge your phone, right? And most of the modern smartphones, they are much better in terms of CPU and, and memory compared to your uh, typical IoT device. So if you design a security protocol that is complicated, that needs to do complex operations, let's say for encryption and so on, and you implement it on an IoT device, it's going to consume a lot of battery. And a battery powered IoT device will run out of battery very soon, and then it'll stop working. For IoT devices, you're not gonna go and change the battery every few days and so on. The idea is you, you deploy the device and it should run at least for a few years or so, right? So, so you want things to be lightweight. Another concern with IoT is privacy, right? So this is an example of a smart trash can, right? Rubbish bin. So there are sensors inside this rubbish bin and uh, the idea is if the bin is full, it can send a signal back and then people can come and empty the bin. But then this, uh, this bin also acts as a hotspot. So people going near, walking nearby, if their phone, in this case, Bluetooth, if the Bluetooth was on or the Wi-Fi was on, uh, you know, it automatically figures out that there was somebody nearby. It keeps scanning the network for nearby people. And as a result, it can track your movement. It knows that you were in this neighborhood at this time of the day. And then similar things also exist about trust and ownership issues. So, you know, your, your smartphone, your cell phone is an example of a very sophisticated IoT device. You can think about it like that because your phone has a lot of sensors in it. Your phone has a gyroscope, it has accelerometers, it has a GPS sensor and things like that. So if you think about Google Maps, right? We, we tend to use Google Maps to give us directions and also inform us about traffic conditions. How? Because while you're accessing Google Maps on your phone, uh, your phone is also sending information back to Google about, you know, from your sensors. So who owns this data? Does Google own it or do you own it? So probably you have clicked somewhere, you know, I accept, I accept terms and conditions. So probably Google owns the data, but you know, in many cases, it's a gray area about who owns your data and, and, and what they can do with it. And another big concern with IoT devices is physical security. Traditionally, when we think about desktops and laptops, we think that they belong to the owner and the owner has physical control over this device. Nobody else can get that. But with IoT devices, many times you will deploy them, you know, out in the open. So for example, if you are talking about a IoT device that measures pollution levels, you would deploy it out in the open. If you're talking about smart traffic light systems, there will be a sensor in the traffic light, in the, in the lamppost. So if I know that there are, you know, if, if these IoT devices are deployed out in the open, somebody can come and steal them. And if they steal the IoT device, now they can open it up and they can read off the memory and do other things to it. Right? So, so we have to worry about physical security. And the second half of my talk, which I'm almost getting to, I guess, I will talk about how we can, you know, what are the solutions to physical security? So now if you look at uh, why are IoT devices targeted? So there are many things. One is, you know, your IoT devices are always turned on and never, they usually don't turn off. As a result, it makes it easier for hackers to get in. And in many cases, the manufacturers uh, don't care about security so much. And one of the reasons is that, you know, when you, deploy, when you, when you design or try to market an IoT device, you're not targeting just computer science and you know, engineering students. If I'm an IoT manufacturer, I want anybody and everybody to be able to buy and then uh, deploy my device. So 
uh, you know, you want a regular person. So for example, non-computer science background people should be able to install and deploy the, the, the IoT device. So if it requires a lot of complicated steps in order to uh, you know, deploy it, people will not buy and use it. So manufacturers try to make it easy to use. And as a result, they skip on security. And many other things, so for example, you know, IoT devices are not checked by users and they don't interact with the devices. So for example, you know, my laptop. One of the ways I know that my laptop has been hacked, one indicator would be that, you know, if the CPU is running all the time, my device becomes slow or my, my laptop becomes very hot because the CPU is running. So if my device is slow, it's very hot, then I know uh, that you know, something yeah, is wrong know. with the device. But you don't do that with an IoT device. You don't interact with an IoT device. So it's very difficult to, uh, to figure out if something is wrong with those devices or if they have been compromised. And then usually when we talk about IoT devices, we talk about millions of these devices. And then, you know, it's attractive to hackers to hack into them because then they can use them to, you know, launch things like denial of service attacks and so on. Well, let's talk about some common vulnerabilities in IoT. One example is, uh, you know, if you open up an IoT device and you look at the PCB, you will see that ports like this are there. And the reason these are there is that during the manufacturing process, they were used by the manufacturer for debugging. You know, these serial ports you can connect and then, uh, you know, use debugging. But once the whole debugging and the development process is done, uh, people don't want to redesign the PCB again. So they leave it there. These ports are there, it's just enclosed in the box so you don't see it. But if you open the box, then you can connect wires here and now you can read off the memory and other things. So that's one. Other common vulnerabilities include things like, you know, uh, default and hard-coded credentials. So we already talked about this when we were talking about the de denial of service attack on DIN. Many times, you know, how, so my IoT device may be generating the data, but how do I visualize or control the device? Usually I have a mobile or a web app to, to interact with the device. Are you sure that the app is secure or your, or your web application is, is, is secure? Many times they are not. Many times your IoT devices use insecure communication. That means that they will not encrypt the data when they are sending it. And the main reason they do this is to save on battery, but then you know this becomes a vulnerability. Uh, many cases, uh, IoT devices don't do integrity check and signature verification. So it's quite easy to load malware on it because they don't care where the software is coming from, they will install it. And in some other cases, you know, so uh, in your laptop, in your phone, if there is a malware discovered by let's say Win Microsoft or, or Linux or Apple, they will update the firmware or the operating system or they will provide patches. It's quite easy to do it for your phones and so on, but not so easy for IoT devices. Manufacturers don't, don't make it easy. And then in many cases, even if you tell their vendor that, you know, there's a bug in your code, Microsoft will do it very quickly. Apple will do it very quickly. But many of these IoT device manufacturers, they don't care. Or they're very slow. Or they're very small companies who don't have the resources to handle it. And then regular stuff such as coding errors and, and physical vulnerabilities that we talked about. And then this is something we... So, so what does it take to secure an IoT device, IoT system? Some things are common. For example, you know, you need to worry about uh, secure data handling, uh, managing trust and establishing trust, user access control, and so on. So these are common things with any traditional computer system. What we also need to do is that IoT devices need to pay more attention to the use of secure protocols. Right now, most of them use, you know, uh, by, by mo most of the time now, if you're accessing a website, you would use HTTPS, sort of becoming by default now. But IoT devices don't use secure versions of protocols, so that needs to change. 
most IoT devices don't tend to have any firewalls or antivirus support. That needs to change. This is changing a little bit now, but more needs to be done there. And the last thing is quite important. Vendors or manufacturers of IoT devices need to pay more attention to patching and, and, and updates. Right? And ultimately, you know, the whole IoT thing, it's not just one thing. It's not just the device vendors which will make your IoT secure. Also, the app developers have to play a, play a part. People who write develop network protocols play a part. Even the government needs to play a part because they are the ones who make rules and, and regulations. And they are the ones who need to come in and make sure that, uh, you know, they, they force IoT, the whole ecosystem of IoT developers and, and software developers, hardware developers, uh, to take security seriously. All right. So that was sort of more of an overview part of my talk. So now let me get more into one specific research topic, and that has to deal with the physical security of IoT. So, you know, when as humans, we log on to some service, maybe our email, you know, the way we do authentication. So one of the security features is authentication. And when you log on to your email, the way you authenticate yourself is you type your username and password. As humans, we can do that. But if an IoT device is going to authenticate itself, there is no human sitting there. So the device has to authenticate itself. So the username and password needs to be stored in the device itself. And usually we would store it in the memory, whether it's non-volatile or battery back, uh, the, the thing needs to be in the memory. But now we were talking just now about physical security, right? In many cases, IoT devices may be deployed in unattended locations. And in this case, they may be stolen quite easily. And if the device is stolen, I can open it up and then I can connect wires maybe and then read off the memory. And then I know what the username and password is. And then there are other ways in which I can do. For example, I could do side channel attacks in which I look at the electromagnetic radiation coming out of the device. I can look at the power supply fluctuations and then again, I can guess what the username and password is or the secret keys are. Okay. So these are possible. So then what can we do so that we don't, so, so, so the research angle I'm coming from is, so what can we do so that the devices do not have to store any secrets in their memory so that even if they're stolen, the hacker or the adversary doesn't get to know what my secrets are, secret keys are. So one option here, or one of the research directions, one option that we can do here is we can look at uh, hardware security primitives, sorry. And what's a hardware security primitive? In this case, what we are trying to do is we are trying to look at specific things that happen inside the hardware of the device, so which is basically in our case, the integrated circuits. And we look at the unique features that happen during, for example, the manufacturing processes of these components that can be exploited for authentication. And what we are really trying to do here is to come up with, you know, for, for example, for humans, one of the ways we identify a human is by looking at their fingerprints, right? So in, in India, we have other card and so on, and everything there has, a, has our fingerprint. Uh, if you're going outside India and then you come back again at the airport, you'll be asked to put your fingerprint. Then with a fingerprint, we can identify a human. So then the idea is, can we also have the equivalent of a fingerprint for semiconductor devices? And it turns out that during the manufacturing process of semiconductors, there are some unique things that happen. There are some uncontrolled variations that occur in the in the physical hardware of the ICs that we can exploit to get the equivalent of a fingerprint. And these are called physical unclonable functions. Physical because they are dependent on the physical hardware, on the wires and the transistors within the within the hardware. Unclonable because you cannot recreate them. You cannot create you, you cannot copy my fingerprint onto your fingers, right? Similarly, they exploit certain things during the manufacturing process so that they cannot be recreated. Okay? 
usually when we do our IC fabrication, it looks something like this, right? So we start with a silicon substrate and then we put a masking film on top. And let's say we are trying to create a gate here. And then, you know, we'll put a photo resist and whatever circuit we want, we put it in the form of a mask. We shine ultraviolet rays on top. And then, uh, you know, we expose, we bake it and so on. And then we go for the etching. And once the etching is done, we do the stripping and ultimately we are left with a circuit like this. Now, when we do the design, we design very accurately. What is the width of this wire? What is the width of this channel and so on? We try to be very, very accurate, but these are of the order of nanometers. And you know, no matter how accurately you put your UV rays and, and no matter how accurately you put your chemicals to do the etching, there will always be minute variations. You cannot control exactly. And today, if you do this process and you repeat the process again after five minutes or after 20 minutes, there'll be some variations that you cannot control. As an example, you know, let's say this is the circuit you're trying to manufacture. You may want to get very, very specific 90 degree angles like this. You will not get them. There'll be some defects or, or small, small, if not defects, they're not really defects, but they're, they're variations. You know, you see these, the, the, the edges are not 90 degree anymore. And then you may have tried to make this exactly, let's say, uh, 50 nanometers, it may be 51 or 52 nanometers. You cannot control one atom here and there, right? You're almost talking about the width of an atom there. And just to give you an example, even if you're doing, let's say, 90 nanometer technology, a gate length is typically 53 nanometers, but you can get a variation of 3, 3.75 nanometers and so on. So, so there, there are variations. So how does that help me in making signatures or fingerprints out of IC devices? So this is how we will do this, right? So consider this circuit here. I have a latch and then I have multiplexers. And to each of these sets of two multiplexers like this, I give some bits to select which input of the multiplexer I'm selecting. Okay. So now if I, if you look at what is happening in this, the same signal is going to all inputs of the multiplexer, right? They're all the inputs are the same, essentially the same signal is going to everywhere. Now, since I gave a zero here, I'll be selecting this and this. So the output of this multiplexer the first multiplexer here will be the red and of the blue, the bottom one will be the blue. And similarly here again, I'm selecting zero. So I'll be selecting these. And here I'm giving one, so I'll be selecting one. So if you look at what is happening at the end, there are two inputs coming to the latch. One is following this blue path the other is following this red path. And on paper, the design, the red path and the blue path are exactly identical. That means if I give a clock here as my, as my signal, this clock should come at the output here at the same time. But just now we talked that, you know, when we try to make this wire, for example, here, the blue wire and the red wire, they should be identical. This wire and this wire, on paper, they're identical. But when I manufacture them, I cannot be exactly precise. So if this is 51 nanometers, maybe this is 51.5 nanometers, half a nanometer difference, some, some difference. And if it is like this, what will happen is the blue signal will reach first. And as a result, this latch will register a one. Similarly, if, uh, you know, by chance, if let's say this was 51.8 nanometers, then the red path will be faster. And in that case, the signal here will, signal here will reach first, and then we will register a zero. So the output here depends on the physical properties of the, of the, of the circuit. And since it's completely random, we cannot control anything. And what I could also do is I could make similar circuits in parallel 
So then here I just get one bit at the output. I can get multiple bits at the output. And this selection that I have here, this is called the challenge. And the bits at the output that I'll get, that's called the response. And if I repeat the same circuit in a different IC, just because I cannot control exactly what the length of these wires would be, every IC is unique. So essentially, if I give the same challenge to four different ICs with the same circuit, or the same physical unclonable function, they will all give me different response functions, responses at the output. And then what we do is we use this property to design security protocols. So I don't make these puffs myself. I have a colleague who does that, he's an IC person. And my, what my interest is in seeing how we can use these puffs to design security protocols. So one example of such a security protocol, maybe let's say I have these IoT devices and they want to authenticate themselves with a server. So then, you know, uh, this is how a typical protocol here would, be would, would look like. So I'll just give you a very brief idea about what the protocol is about. So let's say device A wants to authenticate itself with the server. What we have to do in the initialization phases for this particular server, we have to see if I give this challenge, what will be the response? Some arbitrary challenge, I see what the response is. So at the initialization phase, the server has to be given this challenge and response pair. Okay. So now when the device wants to authenticate itself, first it sends its ID and a nonce. And what the server will do is for this particular ID, it will look up what is the challenge and response in its memory. And then it will send back a message to this. And the message is encrypted using this response in the memory. And essentially what the device has to do is in order to decrypt this message, it will have to pass the challenge through its puff. And once it passes the challenge through its puff, it will get the right response. And using this response, it can now decrypt the message. If anybody else intercepts this message, they can get the challenge. And if they pass the challenge through their own puff, the response will be different. So they cannot decrypt, right? So this is the basic idea. And then the rest, you know, the, 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 the rest is all details, it doesn't matter. Okay. And then uh, we can prove the correctness, we can verify certain security properties and, and things like that. And what we have also done is we have gone and deployed it. This is using my colleague. Uh, we have built a system on chip. Uh, so there's a real IC here, we have real hardware. And then we implement the puff and then we implement our security protocol on top of this and so on. And uh, you know, with IoT devices, I was talking about energy is very important. Uh, we want to minimize the energy consumption as far as possible. Uh, but then, you know, uh, if you use larger key sizes. That means, you know, how many bits will be there in my challenge and how many bits will be there in my response. If you use more bits, of course, your thing will be, uh, your, your protocols will be more secure, but you will end up consuming more energy. Similarly, if your keys are larger, you will also be able to, you'll also, you know, you're, you're exchanging these messages with the server. So the IoT device is sending this message to the server the server sends something back and the IoT device needs to respond back. The size of these messages are proportional to the, to the challenge and response, how many bits you're using, okay? So as a result, the energy used for uh, communication also tends to vary, okay? So, so uh, the, these are some experimental results we have as well. So this was just to get, so, so my goal here was not to, you know, um, make you learn about a new uh, security protocol, but just to tell you that uh, physical security is a challenge for IoT devices and puffs are the physical and clonable functions that I was talking about. Uh, they are one way to solve the problems associated with physical security. However, puffs are not without any issues. Puffs also have issues. So for example, uh, you know, uh, when, you, when, when you have a puff in your IC and your, and your chip is running, it consumes power. And when a chip is running, you'll see the temperature goes up, right? 
And when the temperature changes, uh, you know, we all know that when you heat something, it can expand and so on. So the length of the wires can also change. So it can happen that, uh, you know, because of the rise in temperature, your bits, bits start flipping. Another challenge is more recently, people have been launching machine learning attacks on puffs. So a puff is basically you give a challenge, it will map it to a certain response. You give a different challenge, it will map it to a different response and so on, right? So if I see enough of these challenge response pairs, I can feed it to a machine learning model. And then now if you give a challenge which I've never seen before, let's call it C star, my machine learning algorithm can probably predict what is the response gonna be. If I can do that, then I can break your security protocols. So machine learning attacks are becoming popular on puffs, but then, you know, designers of puffs are also coming up with ways to address this. So anyway, so that's sort of uh, the conclusion of my talk. So what I wanted to basically say uh, is that uh, IoT presents a number of security challenges and uh, a coordinated effort is required at all layers and by all players to solve this. And there are many possible solutions to address these and puffs happen to be one of them, right? And uh, are an active area of research. So puffs happen to be one of these. So I will, I'm gonna stop here and I'll open up for any questions that you may have. Thank you for listening. Uh, so from the uh, people who have been listening, any questions regarding IoT? Uh, I do have few, but uh, I'll open it for others to uh, ask first, then I'll come in, I'll ask, sir. Sure. Hello, sir, am I audible? Yep. Yes, you're audible. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, sir. And uh, um, there's one simple question I would ask. That, sir, you were telling that uh, we can't uh, put strong hardware, that is, uh, strong SOCs in the IoT devices. So, mm -hmm. but we are making improvisations in the SOC only. So, can we uh, better not put more powerful circuits over there? Maybe the cost will increase but we will get a better security until the cloud computing comes in and a higher generation network comes in and things will be more secure than they are right now. That's right. So yes, you're right that, uh, you know, so your thing is why don't we make our chips more powerful? Uh, to be honest, it's not a question of cost. Chips are fairly cheap, they don't cost too much. It's a question of, you know, if I make the chip more powerful, I can do that, but then it's also going to consume a lot of energy. You know, you're, you're, so right now you're using Intel, whatever version, let's say, uh, core i7 or whatever it is, right? That consumes significantly much more power than let's say something from when I was a student, Pentium. So we can make make chips more powerful. It's okay. Sir, but on a mobile level, sorry to interrupt in between. No, no, please go ahead, yeah. Sir, in the smartphones, we have seen that the size of the uh, SOCs are getting smaller. The right. processor size are getting smaller and mm -hmm. their efficiency are increasing day by day. We are right. having five nanometers processor. They will be coming in next one year. Right. And we may get to see two nanometer or three nanometers. So they are getting more efficient also, apart from getting smaller. And with a smartphone, you can, at the end of the day, you can plug it and charge it. Right? With many IoT devices, yes, you won't have that. Right? Okay. So oh. that's the, that's the, so you know, even when we put this with, uh, with puffs, we still have to worry about, you know, how much energy that CPU is consuming. 
ideally we want them to be in the order of microjoules or you know nanojoules are probably quite far away uh, but we care about the energy consumption we can make things smaller you can always make it so small that you know whatever sensor is like in the size of a matchbox right now will be the size of a coin maybe in two years that's okay but you know how much energy would it consume that's the that's the challenge right now i can encrypt everything yes but it's going to consume a lot of energy yes yes sir. thank you so much for answering sure, this question. Not a problem. thank you so much sir. Uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Basically, when we are having different IoT device, uh, for mm. example, we are trying to make a smart home, or we are making trying to make a smart city, and we right. are trying to implement over a bigger area. We mm. usually try to integrate different types of IoT device. The major problem what we are facing is that they don't interact directly. So what mm. we have to do is we use a third-party resource through which we get the data done, and again we pull it back to the other device. Now, if this, uh, uh, when you said that there are many people who needs to work to go to uh, secure our IoT devices, I right. think that is a major area where we are having a issue that that particular area needs to be worked on because this, uh, when we want to talk with one another IoT device, we have to rely on our third party. You know, without the third party, yeah. we are unable to talk with the other iot device right. so i think that is that is also one of the key sure. areas of uh, work where we should also concentrate because uh, one part is surely that uh, iot devices need to be uh, correctly done it, the loopholes that are there that should not be there but i feel that apart from that also this particular zone where we are having iot and it's not able to interact properly Due to this, uh, maybe the researchers, policymakers will come up with something, sir. Your comment on it, sir. Yeah, so that's correct. So interoperability is a problem, and primarily, it's you know, uh, one of the reasons is anything you try to. So, so one device will talk to another device, you know, when when the interfaces are uniform, and things are standardized. Right now, not right now, since whenever, you know, 1960s, 70s, whenever we were talking about any internet-based internet -based thing, there are always different countries and different organizations and each one of them will try to push their own technology. And that's why standardization is very slow. And unless we come up with standards, things are not gonna move. And even, so, you know, I, I, I hate to be pessimistic about this, but, you know, the way things are right now, especially with the, uh, in the area of technology between USA and China, coming up with standards that will satisfy both sides is going to be very difficult. The Americans are not going to trust the Chinese. The Chinese are not going to, you know, listen and they, they will try to push their own, own, own things there. So, I think I completely agree with you that uh, interoperability needs to be there. And the only thing that we can, you can do is then rely on your government. And that's, for example, what Singapore's approach is. They say that, you know, the, the standardization body here, so the, minist so the equivalent of Ministry of Information and whatever there is in India, right? So, so they have come up with a set of guidelines and they say that if you want to sell an IoT device in Singapore, it needs to do this, 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 and this. And if you have that, then you can make this interop interoperability a little bit more easier. If you don't have any policies, then you know, I will make anything I want. And as long as people are willing to buy, I, I will sell it, but yes. And, and it's not just, just the interoper just the exchange of information. If you and I don't agree on a security protocol, we will not be secure anyway. I can, I can implement whatever I want, but then, you know, if you don't implement, then there, there, there's, there's gonna be security vulnerabilities in there, yeah. 
true. So I think again, vendors need to work together, but they will not because why should I follow your technology? Because then I have to pay money to you to use your patents. So ultimately, probably governments may have a bigger role to play. They can force things. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, anybody else uh, who have a question for sir? Okay, sir, then uh, uh, thank you for uh, being with us in this particular conclave, giving the keynote speech. I know it's very late. No, no, at your okay. place. I'm uh, sorry to have. No, uh, no, not a problem. Uh, no, it's okay. But it was nice, and hopefully we will again meet uh, again so that uh, we can sure. interact. We usually sure. have uh, students who go to NUS for different type of activities every uh -huh. year. Okay, okay, so okay. due to COVID this year we didn't go, no, but no, maybe no, next no. time when we go we'll have you there so physically let we me can know. meet and uh, we can yes. exchange our ideas, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. Sir. I usually tend to come to Kolkata twice a year, but I don't know when that's going to happen next, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. Thank you. Listening. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.